Good morning, and I'm Joanne Gore, Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts at Boston, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's forum, Dangerous Intersections, Where Media and Politics Collide. This is the inaugural event for our Center on Media and Society, the newest addition to the UMass Boston's John W. McCormick Graduate School of Policy Studies. Our university has a long history in the area of policy analysis. For over 20 years, the McCormick Institute has maintained its special focus on policy issues and provided elected officials with the expert analysis and evaluation needed to formulate the best public policy. Last year, we built on that strong foundation when we established the John W. McCormick Graduate School of Policy Studies, pulling together four graduate programs, four centers, two institutes, four endowed chairs, and a $6 million endowment. To, to support research and analysis of public policy issues, such as economic development, labor markets, health, housing, criminal justice, media studies, and the environment. Accomplished McCormick Graduate School faculty include Senior Fellow Lou Di Natale, Director of the UMass Poll, who you'll be hearing from later on today at noon. Economist Alan Clayton Matthews, who provides indispensable quarterly analyses of the Bay State economy. Donna Haig Friedman, who is here this afternoon, an authority on homelessness and the Director of the Center for Social Policy. And most importantly, Ellen Hume, the director of our newest of this new center on media and society. As you may know, the field of media studies has developed exponentially in the last 25 years, following the media's own growth in scope and influence on public affairs. Our center, directed by former White House correspondent and national television uh, uh, representative Ellen Hume, answers a pressing need for enhanced study of the media. I'd like to thank Ellen for putting together this day-long program that covers not just White House politics, but also ethnic and community journalism, as well as public opinion polling, a hallmark of the McCormick School. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to a man who has faithfully served on the UMass Board of Trustees since 1999. He's with us today in another capacity. Today, James Mahoney is here on behalf of Bank America, where he is Director of Public Policy. Previously, he was Director of Corporate Communications for Fleet Boston Financial, and we are very grateful to Fleet Boston Financial, now Bank of America, for their support of this event, and we are so happy to have Jim with us today. Thank you, Joanne, and good morning, everyone. It's a real uh, exciting morning here in this spectacular new building for a very important event. And I just wanted to say a quick word. Um, when, we originally, when we originally signed up to uh, sponsor this event, I worked for Fleet. Uh, I now work for Bank of America. And I'm hoping that after breakfast this morning, I might be working for ABC News, but we'll see how, <laughs> see how that goes. I wanted to say a quick word about um, UMass Boston and its Chancellor, Joanne Gora. This is a, uh, an institution that deals with reality. And this morning's conference is a fantastic example of how this deals with reality. This is a very important issue where the rubber meets the road. Just like other issues that UMass Boston deals with, like studying the environmental concerns of Boston Harbor, or educating people in Boston who otherwise may never go to college or David Nyan taking students up to the New Hampshire primary to get a first-hand look at how the political process works, or UMass providing facilities like no other school in the country does to community organizations who don't have facilities to, for their sports programs and other important activities. UMass, UMass Boston is a pioneer in dealing with reality. We often talk of UMass Amherst as the flagship campus. I personally like to think of UMass Boston as the flagship campus in terms of the <laughs> in terms of the mission, in terms of the mission of this of this institution and the job it's doing under the leadership of Joanne Gora. Now, if she can just get the garage fixed, I think we'll really be on our way. It's a great, it's very exciting to be here. I appreciate it very much. And Fleet and Bank of America are very proud to be associated with this conference. Thank you.
Good morning. I hope everybody's enjoying this wonderful food. Thank you, Mike Forcier and all the staff. Welcome to our conference inaugurating UMass Boston's new Center on Media and Society. I'm Ellen Hume. When I came here a year ago at the invitation of Professor Mark Schlesinger, Mark, and Provost Paul Fontaine, Paul, where are you? Thank you. We had no idea that we could move this far this fast. We have exciting plans, including a possible new major, academic major in media and communication studies, and a daily newspaper at the Democratic Convention put out jointly by our students from UMass Boston and Harvard University students connected with the Neiman program. Could some of my students who are here please stand up? Where are my students? Yay! Mark, Paul, Chancellor Gora, Dean Ed Beard, you deserve recognition for many things, but especially for doing so much with so few resources. We owe special thanks also, of course, to Gail Snowden and Fleet Boston Bank of America for underwriting this entire event. Thank you again. Uh, and also, we, I need to thank the remarkable staff of UMass Boston, especially Sandy Blanchett and Gail Hoban, as well as our wonderful student ambassadors and our speakers. Thank you all. Today, we will explore the mysterious interaction of journalism, politics, and policymaking. First, one of New England's most astute and experienced journalists, my colleague David Nyan, will engage ABC anchor and Clinton White House insider George Stephanopoulos in a public conversation. We're very grateful, George, that you've come to Boston just for this event, and to David for making sure that George didn't have to actually write a speech. As promised, you will have a chance to participate also. At every session, we will have microphones positioned for you to add your questions or comments. This is meant to be an interactive conference. I hope that all of this is thought-provoking, not only for everyone here today, but for future use in our classrooms. Now, to introduce and interview George Stephanopoulos, I turn to David Nyan, who is our first visiting fellow at the Center on Media and Society. Everyone here has read David's political columns. David and George, will you please come up and start getting yourselves mic'd while I introduce David. Um, everyone here has read David's political columns, first in the Boston Globe, where he worked for over three decades, and now for the Eagle Tribune chain of newspapers. You also see him on CNN, Emily Rooney's show on WGBH, New England Cable News, and we're so delighted, Phil Balboni, that you're here today, the founder of New England Cable News, and also in other venues. David has been the Globe's White House and Congressional Correspondent, State House Bureau Chief, and Assistant Managing Editor in charge of the newsroom. He has reported from every state and 20 countries, and he's covered every major national political convention since 1972. And until his knee gave out, he used to play basketball twice a week at the UMass Boston gym. David, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, George, welcome to Boston. Um, he, George was born in Fall River. He's no stranger to working here. He was involved with the Dukakis campaign as aide-de-camp to uh, the <laughs> metropolis right over here. And, uh, but before I get to George, I want to talk for a minute about uh, what this building means uh, to the city and to the young people of Massachusetts. I spent my freshman year in high school about half a mile over that way, Boston College High School. And in those days, this section of the city was a dump. Now, it's been reclaimed. We've got the Kennedy Library, you've got the whole UMass campus, now this magnificent building that you look out. And this is very much part of a tradition of reclaiming wasteland and creating institutions that foster the culture and commerce of Massachusetts. Faneuil Hall, uh, Quincy Market, these are the type of landmark projects that resonate through the centuries. And I'm delighted that we can be here today to help launch this magnificent new facility. 
Boston is going to be the site of the Democratic Convention in July, uh, which will be a celebration of Boston's past and of its future potential. And the way that all gets sorted out is through politics. And the guys who help us, the people who help us sort out our politics are the people in the media. Which brings me to George. Those of you who are not in church on Sunday mornings at 10.30 can see Stephanopoulos Tivo, Tivo. sorting out the week. <laughs> this week with George Stephanopoulos. Uh, on Monday night, he was also summoned to uh, anchor Nightline. And there's a funny story about George and Nightline. After he was born in Fall River, his family moved to Cleveland. Uh, his dad is a power in the Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, George then went to Washington, and for some reason he got to know a poor benighted street person who wound up claiming that he had a carload of dynamite next to the Washington, Washington Monument. Monument. Right. And George, being the enterprising fellow <laughs> that he is, let it be known to various uh, TV producers that he knew the guy who was holding the city hostage. <laughs> So Nightline wound up putting George on, talking about his unfortunate friend. And shortly after that, George was interviewed for a job with uh, a congressman from Cleveland, Ed Fian. Fian. Uh, and the story is in George's book. Uh, Fian said to him, well, kid, if you can get yourself on Nightline, I guess you can do something for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now George is hosting Nightline on occasion, hosting his Sunday show. And he is... Uh, 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 when I watched Sunday morning, he had Madeleine Albright, I think Dick Luger, and, and George Will. I, I have to say, George, if I had to have breakfast every Sunday with George Will. <laughs> that would be a sparky breakfast, right? <laughs> um, George made his early reputation as a political spear carrier in the insurgent campaign of Bill Clinton that won the White House 12 years ago. Uh, before that, he'd worked for Dukakis. Uh, I don't know if George will remember this, but really the first time I remember meeting you um, came right across the street on Morrissey Boulevard. In 1992, I went out to pick up you and Clinton at a speech he gave on the economy, and I drove with you with your driver to the Globe, where I was going to introduce the governor, the then governor, and George uh, to about 40 reporters waiting to grill Clinton. And uh, this was the day that Jennifer Flowers' story had broken. One and of the days. One happen. of the days. <laughs> one of the days, one of the stories. <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> and uh, as we, we had to negotiate through two or three television crews on the way up to the Globe conference room. And in the elevator, and remember this is it's a very small elevator, and George is trying to tell Governor Clinton that not only are there three crews out there now, but there's seven more crews arriving, and when we leave here, we're going to be ambushed, and we have to have something to say. And George, <laughs> George is trying to give Clinton, you know, winks and nods about how bad it is. I have no idea what they're talking about. Clinton says, go out there, George, and tell them that this is a one-day story, and we've already dealt with it in Little Rock, and then we'll go upstairs. <laughs> which I did. So, which George <laughs> does, and then he comes back in, and he says, Governor, like this, and I know the decent thing would be for me to step out of the elevator. No way I'm stepping out of the elevator. Clinton grabs him by the shoulders, shakes him, and says, George, go out there and tell them it's a one-day story. Well, it wasn't a one-day story. <laughs> And a lot of what transpired after that is contained in this book. Now, I'm not a big fan of political books, but this is George Stephanopoulos, All Too Human. Uh, he claims he's forgotten all the stories he wrote in it when I asked him about it. It is an incredibly good political memoir. Uh, it is not self-serving. Uh, George confesses to some personal shortcomings. Uh, there is some language more appropriate to the Sopranos than <laughs> to this fine, distinguished audience that we have here today. Um, at one point, Clinton is talking about President Aristide of Haiti, oh. and who the CIA profile had concluded now that he was a manic depressive, that he was a hard guy to deal with. And 
I'll just read you one little passage. We were in the Oval Office discussing CIA leaks to Congress of psychological profiles concluding that Aristide was an unstable manic depressive. Now this is classic Clinton. Clinton, you know, you can make too much of normalcy, Clinton said. <laughs> A lot of normal people are assholes. There's, there's more good stuff in here. <laughs> Buy the book. I um, can't find it anymore, but thank the, you. Uh, <laughs> the serious part of this today, I want to get into five main topics. Politics, the media, uh, Iraq, of course, uh, other people in journalism, and uh, the current White House. Uh, now, this is a fellow who made the transition from politics into journalism. And I wanted to begin today by asking George, uh, have you left the good fight for the dark side, <laughs> or was it the other way around? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. It's taken me, uh, I think they're of a piece, certainly. Um, you know, before I answer that question, though, I have to, you, you bring up that Jennifer Flowers story, and it really was only one of the many days that story broke. And I just ran into, I think, Nigel Hamilton, is here, and I, I had to chastise him because... How could you miss him? He's wearing know, a kilt. They're wearing a kilt over on the side. Um, you know, you said, Clinton said it was a one-day story. This was, what, 14, 12 years ago now, 13 years ago. Just three months ago, I was in a, a, a deposition in a Jennifer Flowers lawsuit against James Carville, Hillary Clinton, and I, um, actually responding to something that was unfortunately not true in your book, but it shows that this was... Um, the, this story uh, went on for, for my life, 13 more years that led to endless lawsuits and things like that, and um, had it only been a one-day story. But to, to answer your question, I, um, I hope that they go together. Um, I know that I bring a lot of the same skills uh, to, to, to both jobs, trying to analyze public policy, explain it in, a, in as clear a way uh, as I can, and try to identify the key points in, in confusing issues where people have to make decisions. I mean, I sort of did that to identify it for, uh, for President Clinton and other, other politicians, and now um, I hope to be, just be able to kind of explain things as clearly as I can, uh, present, as, uh, present the issues um, as fairly as I can, and then let me, people make up their own minds. You there's no question there's a little less stress yeah. in my life now. Uh, I think we've all seen from programs like the West Wing uh, the, the speed at which events come. And as communications director, uh, I thought, come in, come in, Seth, get something to eat. It's OK. Uh, Seth Efron from the Neiman program at Harvard. Uh, the pace at which things come, it's sort of like trying to drink out of a fire hose. You don't have time to take a deep breath. Uh, you often got portrayed unfairly in some of the media. You had very harsh remarks to make about Fox News, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, and you wrote very compellingly about the, uh, the suicide of Vince Foster and the, uh, the terrible impact that had on the, this new White House staff that was grappling with these problems. Uh, now that you're in journalism, do you still have the same harsh view of Fox News and the Wall Street Journal editorial page? Um, well, actually, I don't know if I wrote about Fox News. I don't think Fox News was, was up and running when, at the, when we were in the White House, at least uh, at the beginning. Well, the Murdoch. The, the Murdoch, Murdoch, the papers, yeah, the Post, yeah, and things like yeah. that, absolutely. And the Wall Street Journal editorial page, yeah, I think the, the, the editorials they wrote about Vince Foster, about me, were just were, were made up. I mean, they, they, were, they were absolutely made up. I mean, they wrote about uh, a trip I took. I don't even remember all the details, but I, I got one of those pixelated portraits in the Wall Street Journal editorial page once about a trip I took to Greece in which there were, there were 10 things written that were just untrue. Um, and they were written in a very tendentious way just to make you a target to try to create a congressional investigation of what was going on. I think that the suggestions they made about Vince Foster have been shown. I believe to to have been uh, untrue. I do read them. I think they matter. I think they're they're an important force yeah. in journalism today. But yeah, I wouldn't take back anything I wrote. 
I, I want to get to things like Iraq and the present administration. My last question for you, uh, what's the state of your relations with Mr. and Mrs. Clinton? Have they been on your show? Have they turned down invitations? Are they angry about the book? Where, did that, where does that stand? Uh, Senator Clinton was on my show in uh, December. Okay. She came out and talked about Iraq and Afghanistan. It was very cordial. I've seen them. I, I, I'm not going to say we're close, but I think I've yeah. seen both President uh, and Senator Clinton on several different occasions. Polite. Uh, I can't wait to read his book. <laughs> <laughs> when, when is that out? You know, I don't know. I think there's, it's, there's due a, a, it's due out. At first, yeah. the publisher said that it was coming out in June. Um, the last I heard, it was up at around 1,200 manuscript pages, and he wasn't quite through. Uh, I think he wasn't quite up to the White House yet at that point. So I think there's some editing uh, to do. And then there's this whole byplay going on of, of whether or not uh, it can, first of all, will he be done in time for a June publication, which means he'd have to write the last word sometime the next three or four weeks. Um, and that would still and be a this very was a president, up. as you point out, who would make changes on his State of the Union oh, speech in the limo <laughs> on the way up Pennsylvania Avenue. And but then also, I wonder. I know that he's talking to Senator Kerry quite often, yeah. and I just wonder how much pressure, direct or ind indirect, he's getting from the Kerry campaign to hold off publication until uh, next year. I think June is about the last window. Uh, for where for it to come out where it's not going to have a massive impact on the campaign. Although I, you can't even say that anymore because this campaign has started if, up so if, quickly. If I were Clinton, I would want to have a massive impact on this campaign. And I'm thinking of a launch right around Columbus Day. The short answer is I don't know. Right. Uh, let's skip ahead to the last election. From your point of view, what did Al Gore do wrong in 2000? Well, he did win the popular vote, so it's, it's hard to go too no, far. No, I asked about what he did wrong. <laughs> um, he did that part, right. I actually think that he was in, an, in close to an impossible situation. You know, there's this huge debate in the Democratic Party as, oh, that he made a huge mistake. He didn't run with Bill Clinton. Clinton should have campaigned with him more. Um, I, I, I disagree with that. I mean, I, there might have been a more elegant way to talk about the economy, which was Clinton's greatest strength. But for people who believe that had Bill Clinton campaigned in Wisconsin, in, in, uh, in Missouri, in West Virginia, Tennessee, maybe with the exception of Arkansas, I think any of the, any of the close battleground states, Clinton only, I mean, Gore only won by 4,000 votes in 5,000 votes in Iowa. There was a, still, a, you know, a, a, people still had a big problem with Clinton's personal behavior, and that was that was spilling over onto Gore. So I don't think that that would have been the answer for him. I think he probably would have lost some states that he won. Yeah. That said, I think if you look back, his biggest mistake um, was a personal mistake in how he handled the debates. I think a, a, a clean performance in the debates, and he has a clean win. Uh, in Florida, and it wasn't so much, I mean, if you were watching the first debate, if he just controlled his emotions a little better, he won on points, but he couldn't hide his disdain for, for, for Governor Bush uh, in all the cutaway shots, and that, yeah. that hurt him. And then he had such a radical shift in the second debate from being aggressive in the first debate to, to being very milquetoast in the second debate, and I think it led yeah. to some, you know, he, he who, is this, yeah, who is this guy? Yeah, who is this guy? But other than that, I think he, he just strategically was in a very almost impossible position. George, uh, you can tell us, you don't have to wait for Sunday, who will win in November, <laughs> where, what key states will Kerry win, and, and why will that happen? Ah. In, in 30 seconds. In 30 seconds or less. Uh, well, the, the short, honest answer is I have no idea. That said, um, if you were just looking at all the different historical indicators, um, the president not having a primary opponent, the economy growing for the last nine, nine months, job growth starting uh, to be created, uh, advantage in finances, uh, the fact that most people were focused on national security, um, you know, we're basically at war. That that leads you to think the incumbent Republican president should win. That said, we're in a in a world where the country is basically divided, not at what 47, 47, with the, the swing vote this year probably under 10 percent, maybe as low as six percent. 
um, only 12 to 14 states oh. are going to be actively uh, contested. And I don't think there's any way to, to, to really know. If the job growth that we saw in March held for another two months, in any other year, you'd say Bush can't be beat. But this is not any other year. We're now in a two-front war uh, in Iraq, and I don't know how that's going to spill over. I don't know what the impact would be of another terrorist attack against the U.S. soil. Traditionally, you would say, oh, that's going to work for uh, Bush. Uh, Bush. But after all of this debate over whether or not he did enough to protect us, I'm not sure. After Madrid, you have to want to Yeah, to. and it depends on when it happens. I, was, uh, I want to get on to Iraq after this, but one point, there's one thing you could do to influence the election. Is there any way that you can book Ralph Nader for one of your shows and humiliate the hell out of him? <laughs> He's got to, ha he won't have the impact he had last time. He just, he, th this week, he didn't even get on the ballot in Oregon, which is one of his strongest yeah. well, states. Let me just take general issue with you. The people who are running the Gore campaign in New Hampshire begged Donna Brazile to allow Clinton to make a radio ad in New Hampshire. Uh, Gore lost New Hampshire, the only North state Hampshire. north of Virginia and east of Ohio that uh, Gore failed to carry was four electoral votes. If he had taken those in New Hampshire, he would have been president. And he lost New Hampshire by about 7,600 votes, and Nader got 22,000. And the, the election staff, the Democrats in New Hampshire, were begging for a radio commercial, at least, that could have run late, that wouldn't have spilled over into other states. I, I think that was a key, that may have key mistake that Gore made. Um, Iraq. I was in London uh, 10 days ago and interviewed a British member of parliament who told me uh, a Tory who supported the war was a minister under Thatcher who said he's convinced it will be a serious attempt at a terrorism attack on the British mainland, probably on the transit system, before their general election 14 months from now. And he asked me what I thought was a comparable situation in the US, and I said, everybody I talk to expects an attempted terror incident in the United States before our election. Um, you talked about the, we don't know how to read the potential impact of that. Uh, I think it would have a galvanizing effect on the Depends election. Depends on when it happens. When? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, you know, this is purely speculative, but yeah. I think before September, it's very likely that it's processed in a different way if it's after September. Yeah. I mean, when people have a sense of if they can absorb it, depends on how big yeah. it is, obviously, who was yeah. to blame, could it have been prevented, all those kinds of questions. You can't answer those questions in the heat uh, of the battle or right after an attack, but I think if people had more time to look at it, they might, it, it could cut a different way. You know, in Britain, they, th these arrests they had last week stopped in a, an attack that was probably in operation that was probably just about ready to go against the transit system. Our FBI and Department of Homeland Security put out a new uh, warning just last week about attacks on the railways uh, here this summer. It's, it's, a, it's a, obviously a huge, huge concern. Uh, in the same context of, the, of our election, uh, say bin Laden is captured or killed, what's the impact? Again, depends on when it happens. You'd have to think it's a, a, a big boost to the president. On the other hand, how long will it last? Saddam Hussein was captured in December. President Bush had one of the best weeks of his presidency. Saddam Hussein captured uh, the announcement that Libya was going to disarm in the same week. His approval rating shot back up, not to their historic levels. And then a month later, David Kaye comes out and says there were no weapons, and it starts a three-month slide. So again, it depends on when it happens. There's one theory out there that actually, if bin Laden is captured, and I think Iraq complicates this, here, this theory, um, it frees people up to, to turn away from the wartime uh, president, just as Bill Clinton was able to take advantage of you know, the Cold War over, Iraq over, national security is off the table, he comes in and is able to focus on domestic issues. I don't think uh, you'll see that this time around because of the persistence of Iraq. Uh, 
Mentioning Clinton uh, reminds me that you people suffered a, a terrible hole in the boat just as you're trying to get off the dock with gays in the military, that tough meeting with the Joint Chiefs <laughs> and uh, the incredible accidental way you sort of stumbled into uh, and you were getting pushed by the gay lobby. Uh, do you think that, that uh, the gay marriage issue offers the same potential to hamstring uh, Ker the Kerry campaign? It, it could. I mean, and, and I think Barney Frank has warned about this in part because of the experience yeah. everybody went through yeah. with, with gays in the military. You know, when I wrote about gays in the military and I thought about it, and I was right in the middle of it, I, I do think it was a mistake to push this to the front had you instead focused on uh, employment non-discrimination uh, and focused on that legislation and let that lead and let the military follow. You might have given people time to absorb the issue. The problem with the gay marriage debate is I believe that politically, um, and you guys are living with it right now in, in Massachusetts, whoever gets blamed for rubbing it in people's faces politically loses. So if it looks like Bush is rubbing the constitutional amendment in people's faces, I think there'll be a backlash against him. If it looks, on the other hand, like the gay community is kind of spoiling for a fight and you know flocking to, to, to San Francisco and by the thousands to get married, and they're pushing this on the national agenda, I think the backlash is against the community. And right now, I, I would put it kind of 60-40 against the gay community politically that it's going to help Bush, but not, it's not going to be a home run. Um, but on the margins, um, it, will, it will help. Right, let's talk a little bit about Iraq. We had the terrible news uh, last night, 12 Marines killed. At uh, least. Yeah, it's uh, seeming, uh, seeming to be you know, spinning out of control. Uh, Ted Kennedy calls it Bush's Vietnam. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, danger for any critic of the administration policy to be portrayed as you know, treasonous or disloyal or undermining our troops. Uh, how does Kerry approach this and what should his position be? And after you answer that, I want to talk about whether we need more troops and the political implications of that. I think it's very, very, it's very tough uh, for, for Senator Kerry. I mean, I think that um, you know, it's hard, it was hard to be against the notion of taking Saddam Hussein out. I think that's inarguable. And at the time, it was I think hard. Howard Dean has come to that conclusion. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's also it was also hard at the time. You got to put yourself back in in the mindset back in uh, leading into this war. We didn't know how um, misleading the intelligence reports were, or the way the intelligence reports were used on weapons of mass destruction were. But if you felt that he was close to having weapons of mass destruction, it's pretty hard to argue against, to argue for doing nothing. Um, and I think Senator Kerry you know, showed how difficult it was to deal with that during uh, the primaries. It's hard for him to make this, a, to, 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 to really turn this into a political plus by anything he does. Yeah. Because what does he, he, he has to, support the troops, which I think means supporting more troops in the short run. Um, he can continue his calls to internationalize the problem. It's now joined by Republicans like Richard Lugar uh, on that. That said, it's... Who stepped away from the White House on your program last on Sunday, Sunday. On that issue, on, on the whether or not... June 30th himself. deadline for handing over sovereignty. But that's, you know, that's a perfectly fine rhetorical position to have right now, but tell me a, a, a country that's going to want to get involved in a Iraq, yeah. uh, given the way things are right now, so it's never gonna it's never gonna happen. Yeah. Um, so I think he's in a bit of a box. I think he made it worse, completely understandable. But um, look at the pressures he was under in October, November. Howard Dean is surging. Howard Dean is surging yeah. on the power of Iraq. Both he and John Edwards feel tremendous pressure to vote against the 87 billion dollars. So you think that was a mistake on Kerry's part? Or short now, term, short term, term necessity, short term, I, long term loser. I know loser. what it felt like. I, I'm certain that yeah. in October, in November, or late October, early November, it felt yeah. like he had no choice. Yeah. Um, he would, because and it might, he might have been out of the game if he doesn't have that vote. 
uh, in, in October, November, but there's no question it's going to cause, it's causing him a problem and now. Leaves him open to the flip-flop, the flip -flop which is not the, supporting the easiest case, yeah. argument to make in right, politics. Right, and then if you disqualify yeah. him personally, saying he doesn't have personal credibility yeah. on the issue, anything else he says is tainted. That said, I mean, Bush is taking similar hits on credibility, so I think you can at least fight him yeah. to a draw, but it's never going to be a winner, and it's very, very tricky to deal with it when you're dealing with now yeah. on the average of 10 casualties a day. Let me, let me ask this, and I'm, I'm astonished at this. We've had now 600 American troops killed, another 50 contract employees, who may as well be They won't American count the troops. contract employees, though. I understand that. Bush has been, Bush and Cheney have been to 130 fundraisers. They've not been to one funeral. We have not had one picture out of Dover, Delaware with a, a, an aluminum casket coming down that belt that they use. I mean, Eddie Fui sitting over here, television man, Marine Corps guy, was in Vietnam as a journalist. Uh, how the hell does Bush get away without going to one funeral? He's not getting away with it. Well, um, he has so far. He has. He had up until they, they were they were scattered up until the last week. I mean, I think I think we're all going to look back and say, you know, at first he thought it was last Thursday in Fallujah. Probably going to look back to two Sundays ago, on the day the United States closed that paper belonging to this Shia El Sadr El Sadr, yeah. which started off the latest round of Shia yeah. attacks back as a, as a decisive turning point. Yeah. Uh, in the war, because you can't not say anymore that it's, you, you have to call it a war now. Yeah. And before, we always used to talk about before May 1st and after May 1st, before, you know, during hostilities, after hostilities. Mission not accomplished. Mission not accomplished. It is now clearly a war again, and you saw it. The yeah. minute that happens, where was Bush on Monday in North Carolina? He was meeting with the family of a soldier who, who, had, who had died, uh, had been killed just, just a few weeks before because the pressure is again building. Now, I, the Dover issue is tough. I mean, the military had, had started to close down Dover before uh, Bush got in. And I understand why the White House would not want to have the daily body count um, to, 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 to put an emphasis Well, when you were communications that. director, you had a lot of, a long list of things you didn't want, and the media stuffed it right up your nose. That's true. A different time, though. I mean, the people accepted, I think, at the beginning that this was indeed a war, and they, the public actually showed some tolerance yeah. for casualties because they believed in the goal. Yeah. Now they're questioning the goal and wondering if, if, we, if we can make yeah. any difference. Bush's approval on Iraq has dropped 20 points yeah. in, in a month, and I think that in the face of that, it's gonna be far more difficult for him to get away with things like this. But to your broader point, I think on that issue, and I don't know how we could have done a better job, but clearly on the issue of covering what was really happening with weapons of mass destruction, the, the, the media did drop the ball. Well. I mean, I thought they would be there. We all thought they would be there. And the intelligence said they'd be there. Now this, this tissue of lies and misrepresentations. Why has not anybody in the CIA or the FBI or the NSA been canned? Resigned. The only one who's been punished is uh, Clark you know, for <laughs> blowing the whistle. Well, I think it's hard to, it's hard to fire George Tennant because if you look at, if you look at the, um, all of the information he passed on to the White House, yeah. it was clear he was providing the caveats yeah. uh, to the White House, at least in, in October. And, he was, and then they yeah, left out the buts. They, they left out the buts, they yeah. left out the maybes, they left out the probablys, yeah. or actually they included probablys yeah. <laughs> um, when they said he had something as opposed to leaving it out. And I think that he had them uh, boxed in. Yeah. If they would have fired him, he would have been. He, it would have been very simple for him to say, "Wait a second, I told you all. For example, I told you that this information about uranium from Niger, don't yeah. use it." Yeah. And they used it anyway. So yeah. I don't think they could do anything to him. The FBI. Um, who would you fire? Louis Free was was in charge when. Leading up to September 11th. Bring him back out of retirement and <laughs> right, fire, fire his ass. That's what I would say. <laughs> um, but you're right. No one has taken, yeah. and no one has even, and I don't think they're going to, no one has even apologized. Tony Blair has lost, I think, three cabinet members so far in this. Three. And one leaving on yeah. principle. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I think, Ellen, would this be a good point at which to open it up to questions? 
And while they're moving the mics around, let me just, the final thing I want to ask is, what from your point of view, have, both from having been in the White House and being a, a national journalist, uh, what, what are the political pluses and minuses of being for sending more American troops to Iraq to protect those who are there now? This is the position of Hillary Clinton. I think it's Kerry's position, if you can sort of drag More it out More or less of his position, It's yeah. McCain's position. Um, and I bet it would be Dick Luger's position, I would think, if you it's put he it. He was. No, I, yeah. He basically said that. I'm so sorry. what what are the uh, political pluses and minuses? The, the plus is you're for that. protecting the troops. And yeah. it's clear, I mean, what did we learn last week? Those those contractors who were, who were just desecrated on Thursday were private security contractors who were, one, protecting the, the food supplies. Yeah. That is the job of the United States military. We found out that in the major firefight last week, they were the ones fighting. Private security contractors. Yeah. So, and, and that's because... They're guarding Bremer. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. guarding Bremer. So the, 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 you can't be against calling for more troops to protect the troops that are already there, who are basically, who can be sitting ducks when they're patrolling through seats. That said, here's the danger. It's getting in deeper. Exactly right. I mean, how, what, is the, what is the end point? And if by putting in more troops, you're increasing our commitment, you're increasing the American face on, on the problem, you're acknowledging that it is a war, yeah. uh, that this is not something that is going away anytime soon, you become implicated. Um, but I don't know that and there's a good choice as, here. As George mentioned to me earlier when we were kicking this around, uh, you know, the coalition of the willing is shrinking. It's not expanding. I don't think we can get 20,000 trained fighters from Micronesia to go in there. Spain <laughs> uh, may leave. Yeah. Poland? No, yeah. Poland will stick. All right. Uh, Ellen, is this a good time to have some questions from the crowd? Hello, I'm Donna Haig Friedman. I direct the Center for Social Policy in the McCormick Graduate School. And my question to both of you is, where is the danger in the intersection between media and public policy? Where's the danger? The name of this conference is Dangerous Intersection. <laughs> What's the danger? George thought that meant the <laughs> traffic light at Morrison Boulevard. <laughs> um, well, I think one of the dangers is uh, overreacting to daily stories in the media when you're on the side of, of, of the practitioner. Um, and uh, sort of, uh, and I think you see an example of this. It wasn't exactly media. I mean, media generally follows real events, but I was thinking about Mogadishu uh, this, this week. And, uh, you know, one of the dangers we saw is that pictures can, can have a disproportionate Harsh pictures can have a disproportionate effect. Um, you know, they were horrible. He's done. Almost political support for the uh, operation in Somalia evaporated before the public support did. They kind of worked. Uh, together. I think early on President Clinton tried to say, listen, we have to stay, this is important, but the, the Congress bailed out pretty quickly. I think that, it, it, that then the administration bailed out uh, pretty quickly and public opinion followed from that, but it was all in reaction to those uh, pictures at first. Um, and, but then the, <laughs> that isn't an argument for censorship because I turn it back to conversations we were having inside ABC News last Thursday over how to handle the pictures from Fallujah, and there were dangers on either side. There's a danger of, 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 of airing the pictures, and, and then you, you appear insensitive uh, to your viewers. Perhaps you overemphasize um, the, you know, the impact um, by, by, by rubbing people's face in these pictures. On the other hand, if you sanitize the war and don't show people the reality of it, then you're not giving them the tools to make their decisions uh, over, over whether or not we should be there either. So you have to, to always balance uh, that out. Um, I think the danger on the media side, which is, you know, I was relatively new to this when I started, is to fall into, and Thomas Patterson, I guess, is going to be on the panel later today, is going to talk about this, is to 
when skepticism slides too easily uh, into cynicism about what government officials are doing, how they make uh, their decisions. And for me, I mean, I, I probably err too much on the other side because I served. I mean, just a, a story on that. Um, you know, I remember during, when the Enron story first broke and the, all the stories came out over, did Paul O'Neill call or, or take a call from Enron? Uh, and, you know, was he trying to uh, unfairly impact the investigation? And his answer was, you know, that was three weeks after September 11th. I was worried about terrorist financing. I was worried about whether the financial system was going to uh, stay afloat. I was dealing with uh, 15 meetings a day, 100 phone calls a day. I don't really remember what was said. I don't think I did anything. Th th for me, that showed a great divide between me and some of my colleagues in the newsroom. Because when he said that, it made absolutely perfect sense to me. And a dozen of my colleagues uh, couldn't accept it on grounds. I think in that case, I turned out a self-serving story. In that case, I, I think I turned out to be more right than wrong, but there are just as many times where you're not, where I, I'm not skeptical enough about well, the kind of should have told saying. Kenneth later called Dick Cheney. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> he had his Someone number at home. home. I mean, let's not <laughs> get ourselves about that. Yes, ma'am, right here. You can just shout at us. We can hear you. I'm Andrea Taylor from the Education Development Center, Center for Media and Community. And I want to ask, sort of following on the earlier discussion, if you're at all concerned about the increasing consolidation in the media and the fact that there are fewer outlets for less information in a very information-rich society when the public really has to go on its own to find out about the issues and to be informed and, and eager participating citizens as both former politician or a person working in the political arena and now a journalist, do you think we should be concerned about this and, and what can we look forward to? I mean, the FCC is moving toward giving greater consolidation license in this country. They were held at bay by citizen groups last summer. But the tendency is to have fewer and fewer outlets for, for information and how is that going to affect our democracy? Um, I'm torn over this because I, I'm not sure I agree with uh, one of your assumptions. You say the tendency is to have fewer and fewer outlets of information. I think we're overloaded with information. You can, you can get all kinds of information at any moment at the touch of your fingertips. Uh, now, I think what we're lacking, and this is where, it's so I think that overall, you know, there's no problem with, with information. What we're lacking, but what we have is relatively few filters. I mean, you've got more than we used to have. We now have, instead of just the three major networks, you have two, two and possibly three pretty significant uh, cable networks. And it is true that these outlets are now basically owned by three, four uh, major, major corporations, and that that can lead to um, some homogenization of, of outlook. And you, you see, you know, there was a Fox effect, I think, during the last war. Fox was, you know, kind of kind of waving the flag and that puts pressure on everybody else uh, to do the same. So I think that that is a concern, but, you know, we have uh, so many different ways to get information, whether it's uh, on the internet, over radio, over, we have more television now uh, than we used to have, probably fewer newspapers uh, than we used to have, but the, the difficulty, I think, for people now is trying to figure out how to put all the information in context, how to understand uh, what they're hearing, and uh, that's Bill O'Reilly's job. <laughs> well, but and it, it could be. I mean, and people. That's the other issue. People are now choosing. One of the dangers of the internet is that you tend to. It becomes self-reinforcing. Yeah, you tend to go to yeah, You tend to go to websites that, that that publish information that you already agree with, or you tend to go to television stations that broadcast information that you already agree with, and all that can do is convince you even more. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think the networks traditionally had, had performed the function of helping people sort through that. It's still our obligation. It's getting harder to do. People, uh, I did a project at the Kennedy School on fairness in the media, uh, which sort of fell apart after 9-11. But uh, the, you, I would tell these young people that you are, in the same way that you are what you eat, what you consume for journalism is what shapes your politics and your worldview. 
And the danger I see in, in right-wing talk radio or the Fox News approach to things is that people become uh, much narrower, much less open to other points of view, and it becomes very self-reinforcing, and there's a, a paranoia effect. They're out to get us. I mean, the right-wing is you know, been running the government, and yet they, they're the ones who say, we're under attack, it's those damn liberals who, uh, Clear Channel Radio controls 1,200 radio stations, and it's a decidedly right-wing agenda. And I think a lot of the cable television news, and certainly the, uh, the right-wing radio talk shows, skew the playing field. Uh, I used to say as, as a, I noticed this when Reagan came in, what the right-wing succeeded in doing was they moved the sidelines. It used to be there was a right sideline and a left sideline. Well, they moved the left sideline to the middle of the field. So now we're all playing on the right hand, you know, from the, from the hash mark over on the right hand side. Another question, Joanne Gora. <laughs> You held a very important position in the Clinton administration. Would you like to evaluate the performance for us of the individuals who have held that position in the Bush administration? Ah, the old performance <laughs> review. Is this something for the faculty should be taking notes here? Uh, well, it depends on uh, what the job. I guess basically the closest jobs to what I held were some combination of what Karen Hughes, Dan Bartlett, and Carl Rove uh, do. I think that. Um, what I admire them for is their discipline. Um, there's no question they were more disciplined, both in terms of subject matter that the president would address and in, con and in um, control over the various spokespeople in the administration than we were, uh, undeniable. I think you now see the downsides uh, of discipline. They were so disciplined, they were so controlled that we didn't necessarily have a full airing of what exactly was happening uh, in the administration in the run-up uh, to war and uh, and in the estimates of what Saddam Hussein had. I also think that, um, and they're starting to pay the price for this as well. It's not just about national security issues. I think one of Kerry's, and you start to see him uh, use it more now, you've seen President Bush's numbers on trust and credibility really have a, a steep slide over the last s two to three months, basically ever since David Kay came out with this report. But you have David Kay, you have Richard Clark, you have this man Richard Foster, who was the Medicare actuary who's claiming that he was, they tried to fire him uh, because he wanted to give the, the Paul numbers. Paul O'Neill. And you have Paul O'Neill. Uh, he, he received slightly lighter treatment than the others did. And I think now, because they were so disciplined, because they are so disciplined, because they're acculturated to see, and this happens to everyone in the White House, it happened to me, to see the people who have opposing points of views as enemies, they're paying the price for that. Um, and, and facing questions about, are they being honest? Are they being straight? Um, are they cooking the books? And that's a danger uh, for them right now. In some ways, their job was made easier by September 11th because you had a basically unified um, country. And I think what they're, where they, I think where they were better at us is in kind of long-term planning, um, choosing two or three priorities, communicating to the country about those two or three priorities, where they're slightly, um, in part because they're only getting tested on it now, where they're slightly worse than us, and we were there from the first days, is responding to events and um, in, in being flexible in how they uh, deal with crises. And I think that they, they're, they're a little too hidebound for that, and they're learning about it now. John Shattuck. Uh, John Shattuck, CEO of the Kennedy Library Last question from this Library table, Fund, by the way. <laughs> that was a, no fix. Um, George, this is uh, uh, 10 years ago this week, the Rwanda genocide took place. And uh, I, I want to sort of follow up the question on dangerous intersections. Um, the dangerous intersection of, of public policy and media uh, may well have been one of the reasons why the U.S. and other countries didn't intervene to stop that genocide. Um, you mentioned, and I've written about the Somalia crisis and the fact that that had a big impact, I think, on not doing something about a Rwanda, but I'd like to hear 
Your okay, thoughts from inside the White House, I have thoughts from inside the yeah, State and Department. Yeah, and you were probably closer to it uh, than I was, which, which reveals one of the problems. I mean, I think people who, you, you were doing human rights then, correct, at that time, people who were close to the situation understood how dire it was. It wasn't necessarily filtering up in the same exact, in the same way that you felt it. And I think that shows one of the dangers, you know, you talk about dangers, dangers, overload. Um, that both the, the political system and the media have a hard time dealing with more than one or two crises at the same time. And just, you know, you've got it, there's a, there's a structural problem. There's 22 minutes on the evening news. You're going to say, you're, you're, you're setting the agenda by how many minutes of those 22 you devote to a particular problem uh, on each, uh, e each night. I mean, you I, was, I was in an email exchange yesterday that was provoked by Samantha Powers article in the New York Times yesterday about how now you now have this humanitarian crisis in Darfur, Sudan, which isn't nearly as uh, horrendous, as it, or it's not on the scale of what was happening in Rwanda, but a friend of mine was emailing me saying, see, you guys should go do this, you don't want Rwanda to happen again. And then I say, you know, in theory you're right, but are you saying last night on the evening news there was the first nine minutes, which you could argue was almost underplayed, was what was happening in Iraq? Would you not have done that? I don't know, but to answer your question about going back to 1994, at the time we were coming out of Somalia, the, the Clinton administration was finally getting galvanized for a serious effort in Bosnia after not paying enough attention in 1993, and so you were dealing with overload one more time of both the political, uh, there, and there wasn't that much coverage back in the American media of, of Rwanda, so it was almost easier to say no, Bosnia is more important, our national security is implicated in a more vital way in the heartland of Europe. We've seen uh, for the, through the experience of Somalia that there is precious uh, little political and then public support for intervening in Africa where it's perceived that our national security interests are not at stake and this is a purely humanitarian effort. And I think on top of that, um, at least, I can only speak for myself and, and others who've spoken about it in the White House, I don't think that I was aware of the scale uh, of the killing. It was almost too much to, to comprehend. Uh, for that, you know, we can be faulted. I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I was thinking about it when you were talking about the West Wing. It would be great to be able to go into a job at a place like the White House with all the experience, with all the knowledge and wisdom built up from already having done it, but without actually having done it. <laughs> so that you, um, because then you would, you would understand, I think, better how to take, get some distance from the day to day and, and, and really be more attuned to when you get this, uh, now it would be email, in 1994 it wasn't, from someone at the UN or from someone in the, in, in the State Department who says, you know, you really have to pay attention to this, you would see it in a different way than you see it through your first time uh, out. But at the time, I think that both, um, both uh, the White House, to some extent the United Nations system, certainly the Congress and the media, all uh, couldn't pay enough attention to that because they felt like there were other problems that were either more dire or where our national security was more implicated at exactly the same moment. Uh, I'm going to take a question from, yes ma'am, you, right there, and then I'm warning the UMass Boston kids, I want a question from you after this, so somebody come up with a good question, put your heads uh, you're together. A at heart. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, I'm Joellen Easton from the Comparative Media Studies Program at MIT. I have two questions for you, Mr. Stephanopoulos. The first one is you've worked both in an administration and in the media. Where do you feel that you have had more implicit or explicit influence on policy? In which role? And the second question, rather unrelated, is do you think that the new liberal radio network, the Air America radio network, is going to have an influence on the election? On the election? Um, I'll answer that first because I think it's easier. I think uh, it will have some impact on the on the media on the media going into the election, but it's only on six stations. I don't think it's going to have any impact on real voters, uh, any direct 
real impact on real voters going into this election. Because it's, it, this speaks to the, something of what I was talking about before. That network may galvanize um, a group that's already uh, going to vote against Bush. I don't think it's going to change anyone's mind, at least not in the next uh, six months. In the, on your first question, it's more difficult um, to answer. I think on any single day uh, in the White House, you have the potential, and I'm sure there were days where I had more explicit um, impact on public policy than any six months in the media, but that's, I think that's unique to the White House. I mean, it's just, uh, and to the job I had. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a place where, quite literally, the right sentence at the right moment spoken in a meeting, or the right phone call, or the wrong phone call <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the right moment, <laughs> is going to move billions of dollars in, in, in resources or affect the, the decision making of a president. So I don't, think, I don't think you can really compare it in that way. That said, I think that's a relatively unique experience that you, you know, presidents are elected for four year terms. Uh, even the longest serving White House aides like Richard Clark can do it, and he's unique because he was non-political, can do it for 12 years. It's not, a, it's not a lifetime career. And I hope that over the course of my career, particularly in the program I have now where you can really week to week to week um, have public policy debates, illuminate issues, um, explain them to the public, I think that there's over time the possibility of having impact in that way, but never the kind of discrete, day-to-day, -day, direct uh, influence like you can have in the White House. You know, speaking of the wrong phone call, I'm reminded during the impeachment trial in the House, uh, Representative Lindsey Graham of South Carolina referring to the 2.30 a.m. phone call from Clinton to Lewinsky, <laughs> Lindsey Graham said something like, I don't know about y'all, but where I come from, you call anyone at 2.30 in the morning, you're up to no good. <laughs> <laughs> now, who has the question over here? I'm not going to let you guys up. Somebody's going to have a question. <laughs> we'll go to the back table. You think about it hard. Yes, ma'am, up in the back, in the corner. Hi, my name's Kathleen Donaher. I'm a doctoral student in the College of Nursing. A little and closer, Health. the mic a little closer, please. Kathleen Donaher, I'm a doctoral student in nursing and health policy in the College of Nursing and Health Policy. And as I've listened to the dialogue, I've tried to estimate a model predicting the outcome of the election. So some just of the variables. Just over breakfast. Wow, that's something. <laughs> some of the variables that I have in the model. The first would be a terrorist event. The second would be the situation in Iraq, and the third would be some of the key states. And I looked at the model and I said, Oh my gosh, the media. The media is a moderator in this model. So the question posed is: To what extent will the media predict the outcome? of the election. And wow. if you wanted to use dollars in that, is there a change in the dollars that, for example, a 10% increase in the money spent is likely to influence the outcome? By the media or the campaigns? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're not going to be spending more money in the media. We're all cutting back, so that's, um, I think. Uh, to, tell me your first question again, because I got, I got side. Just the, you know. The media is a moderator. You talked about the likelihood of a, of a terrorist right. event. You talked about the situation in Iraq. And there are key states. So the effects will be indirect or moderated by the media. How much of the outcome in the election, what's the, what's the, effect, what's the effect of the media in estimating the outcome? Um, I think very small this time around, um, in part because so many, of the, so many of the states have already made up their mind. I mean, I think you've got, I think you've got, as I said at the top, more than 90% of the country that's already made up its mind 
that just they're not, and they're not moving one way or the other. Now, the word it gets difficult, and you're looking at a guy who, my worst class was always algebra and, and anything to do with statistics, so I think, what is the, so you're dealing with a smaller pool of voters that can be impacted, and you have to try to figure out how much is that smaller pool affected by what they see uh, on the media, and I think that's very difficult to determine. I firmly believe that given the fact that all the campaigns, that what are all the campaigns are spending on the media this time around, even though you see in the short run some evidence that President Bush's early ad spending is having some marginal impact in some of the states. I think overall that the money spent on television and radio this time around is going to cancel each other out. And that the far more effective use of dollars by the campaigns this time around is going to be on individualized voter contact. Um, one, because I think people tend to distrust what they're seeing in the media more now than they used to anyway, too, because they're just saturated uh, by it, especially in these key states, because both campaigns are spending all the money in these key states, it just becomes white noise for an average uh, viewer each day. And what they're going to tend to trust more and more is what they hear from their friends, what they get over email, uh, the kind of conversations that are sparked by human contact. And so I think that the campaigns are going to be spending much more money on that. Um, and then I guess, finally, and this is an argument against my own current profession, or the impact of my current profession, I think that presidential elections are determined by big, big things, and the campaigns and the coverage of campaigns matter only at the margins. I mean, I think there's some aberrations uh, to that. I think, for example, that at George Bush, 41 run a better campaign and been more engaged earlier, I think it's conceivable that he could have beaten Bill Clinton in 1992. There's a big argument over whether, whether that was possible or not. Uh, I think it's conceivable on the flip side that had we run a better campaign in 1988, at least could have been closer. I'm not, I'm not sure whether or not uh, Dukakis uh, could have won, but basically the broad trends in the economy, the broad trends in what's happening uh, in national security matter far more than, than, than the day-to-day -day coverage of the media. And it's going to come down to, for most people, two simple, simple questions um, that, all, that are subsumed by all your variables. Are people better off now than they were four years ago? Are they safer now than they were four years ago? I think for most people, it's starting, you know, there's still some pockets, but people are starting to feel better than they were feeling economically uh, now. I mean, I think you see the trend is on the, is on the rise. I think, on the other hand, they may not be feeling safer. Uh, and so that Bush may be strongest where he's weak and weakest where he's strong, how that's going to balance out, yet it's, you know, it's only April. And the short answer is tune in 10.30 Sunday morning, <laughs> the Sunday before the election. George will give you your answer. And I will not make a prediction before then, right? <laughs> Are the students ready with a question? Yes, ma'am, right here. This young lady right here, the microphone's coming right over to you. Let's give her a hand for coming up with a question. Um, I'm just curious what you think about the emergence of... Uh, uh, tell, first, tell me your name and where you're from. I'm Kristen de Oliveira. I'm an American Studies student at UMass Boston. Yeah. <laughs> the pressure's on, Christian. This better be good. <laughs> Um, what do you think about the emergence of weblogs as an alternative to traditional forms of media? And how do you, well, do you think this will impact the press in the future? It's already impacted uh, the press because I think we all read them uh, every day. I mean, just to get a sense of what people are thinking. I mean, it's, it's, I think they can be a tremendous tool. You know, there was during the, during the initial military operations in Iraq, there was a great weblog, I don't remember the name of it now, but by a, 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 a young Iraqi in Baghdad who was just giving a very personal uh, view of what was happening every day, which helped inform, it brought you into Baghdad in a way you could, for those of us who weren't assigned there, uh, at least one slice of it, in a way that was never before uh, possible. Um, I find that I tend to, you know, to try to deal with this problem of information overload, I limit how much I will look at on a daily basis. In fact, I don't think now I look at any blogs 
on a daily basis because you can just get sucked into these very incestual debates on, on some of the, law, at the blogs that basically end up mattering only to the people that are writing them. Um, but I find as a consumer of media who then becomes a, a producer that I'll tend to follow the trail once I'm interested in a subject. You know, for the last 10 days, we've had to spend a lot more time on Iraq, and that led me through two or three clicks to this professor out of the University of Michigan, I think named Juan Cole, who writes, I think, one of the most perceptive um, and thoughtful uh, blogs on just Iraq every single day. So I think it's a very useful tool in that way that once you find a subject, you can uh, research much more quickly, much more deeply than was ever before possible. And individual citizens can do the same team thing. That's the great power of, of the log. I think the great danger is what I talked about earlier. You tend only to follow the links uh, to things that you, where you're already convinced and um, that the, it encourages a kind of nastiness in discourse, the more the anonymous blogs and the anonymous chat rooms, because you don't have to put your name or your face uh, in front of the things that you're saying. Uh, George, we're very grateful I mean, that you put your right. name <laughs> and your face here at UMass Boston today. Uh, I know you have to catch a plane to go back to New York, but uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Our next meeting is at 1030 in the next room. Please come and join us there and give us a big hand of applause for George and David. Thank you. Thanks,